And we hear, since we're young, we hear a lot of things about addictions, mostly negative ones. And um, today's talk is on positive addictions, particularly one called the helper's high that I want to talk about. Um, so I want to start off with a little story. In the uh, 1678 classic, The Pilgrim's Progress, there's a story about a character called Old Honest. And he poses a riddle um, to an innkeeper named Gaius. And the riddle goes, a man there was, though some did count him mad, the more he cast away, the more he had. And so Gaius solved the riddle by saying thus, he that bestows his goods upon the poor shall have as much again and ten times more. And to me, this story kind of embodies the way that we have thought about charity and helping others throughout human history, that it's something good, something rewarding, something that we should be doing. However, much less attention has been paid to the question of how charitable behavior benefits the giver. So if you help someone, how does it benefit you? And I just want to show you some quick facts. And this is national um, census data from the US. And that people that regularly volunteer and regularly donate to charity are 42% more likely to report that they're very happy. Similarly, they're 27% more likely to report that they're in excellent health. Now you might say this is survey data. What does this really prove? Right? It doesn't prove that donating and helping people causes increased happiness or better health. And so colleagues of mine have looked at this very question and they've done lots of experiments with people that are chronically ill, with people that are healthy, with young people, with elderly. And what they find time and time again is that helping other people is associated not only with increased emotional well-being, but it also produces observable physiological changes. And some of these include relief from depression, weight control, immune system improvement, chronic pain reduction, lower blood pressure. So these are actual symptoms that we can observe. To give you an idea of how these experiments go, there was this one experiment where they paired two people that were both chronically ill, and they've asked one, one of the persons to just provide an empathetic ear to the other person. Now, obviously, when we measure people's physiological responses, the person that's receiving help obviously is doing better because they can vent about their problems. But what's interesting is that the person that's providing the empathetic ear actually does much better than the other person, right? So the benefits are actually greater for that person. And so you might wonder, how is that? How is it possible that when you help someone, the person that is helping actually feels just as good as the person that they're helping. And the reason for this is that when we're busy helping other people, we're processing positive emotions such as compassion and empathy, which leaves less room for negative emotions. And also it distracts the brain from our ability to experience pain. And we can take this one step further. We can look at people's brain when they donate or merely when they think about donating. And so here's an fMRI scan. And on your left, you'll see a part of the brain, what we refer to as the mesolimbic system. It's also called the reward, um, the, um, the pleasure center of the brain. And what's interesting is that this part of the brain is active when we experience positive stimuli. For example, when we're having sex or eating good food. And it's the same part of the brain that's active when we merely think about donating or helping others. And this part of the brain on the right side is called the subgenial area. It releases neuromodulators like vasopressin and oxytocin. And these are neurotransmitters that actually make you feel good. And so when doing good actually makes people feel good, this is what psychologists refer to as the helper's high. And there have been many cases where people have actually become addicted to the experience of volunteering. A few years ago, I was interested in the question or whether or not our conscious intention to donate whether that's driven by social pressure, right? Or are we just doing it because other people are doing it? Or is it predicted by sense of morality, right? Our internal code of conduct. Is this the right or wrong thing to do? And by and large, the intention to donate is predicted by our own sense of morality. And now it's very common to think that what we believe is right or wrong is a product of our culture and religion and so forth. But I hope to have illustrated today that it's much more than that, right? So there's good reason to assume that morality actually evolved. When you think about it, people that are able to empathize and be compassionate, that actually produces a collective benefit for the group as a whole. It's an evolutionary adaptive strategy. And experiments, as I said, have shown that when you help people, it actually causes increased happiness. It causes increased physical well-being. And consider that when you just think about helping others, it activates a pleasure center that's located within, within our brains, right? 
And so, yes, to some extent, morality is a learned construct, but it is much more likely that um, this biological responses that we have to helping other people co-evolved with the onset of, of human culture. And so what I want to leave you with today is when I designed this talk, what message is worth spreading? And when you're not feeling well, when you're worried about something, when you're in pain, forget about Zoloft and Xanax and Prozac, right? Why would you spend $200 on an expensive therapist to talk about why you're flunking out of Yale? Are you not putting in the effort, playing too much beer pong, right? So when I thought about this is that what I hope to illustrate with this talk is that there's actually a much simpler solution. If you want to feel good, go out and help somebody. Thank you.